Welcome to Build, I'm Ash Percival and we are coming to you live from London. Now, the Bard is back as Upstart Pro Series 3 starts next Wednesday. And here to tell us all about it, it's only the star of the show, it's David Mitchell. Hi. Uh, now, of course, if you've got any questions that you desperately want David to answer, you can tweet us. We are at Bill Series LDN. Or if you're watching this on Facebook or on the app, you can also leave your questions somewhere down the bottom or on the side there. Now, David, hello. Welcome to Build. Thank you for having me. Lovely to have you with us. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Well, we're it's, very it's happy nice to have here you. on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> now, Upstart Crow Series 3, it starts next week. Uh, I've seen episode one already. I, got, I was lucky enough to see it yesterday. Uh, Shakespeare, he's in a bit of a funny place when we first rejoin him, isn't he? Things aren't going exactly to plan for him, are they? Well, they, I mean, it, it, the whole show is about his, his struggle for what he feels he deserves, which is, uh, you know, eternal fame, <laughs> which you know, we all happily know he achieved. Spoiler! So, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yes, he's, uh, I mean, and he's, tr he's struggling to write a, a comedy... And everyone keeps saying that, you know, he's not funny. I don't know what your views are from if you've seen Shakespeare comedies. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think you know, some of his jokes land better than others. I think um, <laughs> any, anyone would say that. And so, he, yes, he's struggling to make his new idea for a play is, uh, is Midsummer Night's Dream. And it's about, uh, and he feels it's about time there was some gritty realistic drama that acknowledged the fairies, pixies and sprites that, lives, <laughs> that live in the woods, uh, which he believes in wholeheartedly. It's the um, PL something community. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah, and I, having had to learn that line, <laughs> I have since forgotten it. So but there, there, there's a special term he uses for the, uh, the various magical creatures that he think re thinks really exist. And uh, yes, so he's written this comedy about them and no one finds it funny at all. <laughs> and, uh, and so he's looking for the key funny moments to, to lift the piece. No, I don't know about you, but sort of compared to like series, I think particularly series one, he seems a lot more likable this time around. I'm kind of really rooting for him this time. Oh, well, I'm, I, I'm devastated to hear you weren't before. <laughs> but <laughs> Would you agree that he, I think he's got more likable over I, the series? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think that the, I, I mean, the, the terrible truth is I just wanted him to be likable to begin with. I just want to be liked, Aww. even with a bald cap. <laughs> on and um uh, and now i th well i think he's one of the reasons i think he's a good um subject for a sitcom is he's a sort of as ben elton has written him he's a classic sitcom figure you know mm. he's in some ways he's not likable he's uh he's a vain he's uh self-interested he he he's very focused on his own needs but in other ways he is likable because he's sort of an an every man who's struggling against the, the feelings that the wider world uh, don't <laughs> rate him as highly as as they should do and and i think in those sort of those feelings of um uh, you know on the one hand self loathing and self-doubt on the other hand sort of uh, little glimpses of megalomania i think that is the human condition <laughs> that's sort of how we all feel you know yeah i'm great oh no i'm terrible <laughs> and we oscillate between the two madly or maybe well, that's just with people people with we mental can health see issues. that in action actually we've got a clip from episode one which i think perfectly exemplifies what oh, you're talking about yeah. let's take a look <laughs> that must have been a lot of fun to have that horse's head playing with on set right Sorry, sir. I, I said that must have been a lot of fun with that horse's head on set. Uh, I don't know what you're implying. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the thing is, it, it, it's... <laughs> It's tremendous fun to, to make, which is, you know, always a, I'm nervous to say that making a comedy show is fun in case, you know, people say, well, it's, it's no fun to bloody watch. Um, <laughs> but it is fun to make, and it's, a, it's sort of how I imagined uh, making TV would be like before I got involved, and it, it isn't often like that. But, you know, it's, a, it's shot multi-camera in a studio with a studio audience. They build a beautiful set. We get dressed up, and we've had a sort of week to rehearse, and we turn up, and we put on a funny play <laughs> and uh, you know usually people laugh and that's it's 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 exactly what I hoped doing a sitcom would be like. I want to talk to you about the studio aspect of it because I guess some of this the sitcom stuff that you've done in the past has been without the studio audience right how have you found that that sort of experience this time around? Well I, I love it and and I and I uh, you know I mean I'm very proud of doing Peep Show and Back and uh, you know they're shows I, I'm really 
pleased to be involved in, but the process of filming that sort of thing is not exhilarating. <laughs> They're long days, early starts, doing it again and again and again. Yeah. It's, you know, and then at the end, you have a feeling of satisfaction if it's a good show, and that's great. But during it, it feels like work. Um, <laughs> doing that doesn't feel like work. It feels like showing off and getting laughs. laughs. And that was, that's what I'm in this for. <laughs> so, so it's, I, yeah, I love the fact that you get the laugh. You, you judge it in your own mind whether you've delivered the line as you'd hoped you would. Yeah, because sort of you've got that instant reaction, then. right? Exactly, yeah. And you, you can tell. A, you say, right, yeah, that, that joke worked. They liked it. Mm. That'll be good. You, could, you never know that when you're just, you know, filming with one camera and the crew who, you know, aren't allowed to laugh even if they wanted to because <laughs> it, you know, makes a noise that people don't want. We want that noise in a multi-camera thing. And then I guess if you don't get the laugh, you can just do it all over again, can't you, until you do get the laugh, yeah, which is perfect. Until people are just so desperate to leave, they'll make, <laughs> they'll make any noise we tell them to. Now, I want to talk to you about the sort of the props and the costumes. How long does it take you to turn into Shakespeare? What's, what's the process like? Um, it's the, the makeup takes an uh, hour, hour and a quarter. Okay, Absolutely. that's not too bad, no, right? Not, no, not too bad. And what process is, is, is it? A bowl cap and a wig? Is the how, what's that set up? It's what's just, going on up I, there? I, I, I get told very worrying things until enough of my hair falls out. <laughs> um, no, yes, it's, it's it's just it's a it's a sort of um, latex prosthetic bald cap thing that gets glued on. Well, it's very, very carefully. convincing. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, and I think I, he refers to it in the show as having a tall forehead. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's one of the running jokes in, <laughs> in the script is that he is that this interpretation of Shakespeare is in complete denial about his male pattern baldness. <laughs> he just says yeah, he has a large forehead, uh, he has low eyebrows, he has whatever. Uh, I think know. it's a lot of things that many men sympathise with, uh, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Looking ahead to the rest of the series, there's uh, an episode that's coming up that focuses on catfishing with a very sort of 16th century twist. Can you tell us a little bit about focuses that? Focuses on what? Catfishing. Now that is a modern expression, isn't it? <laughs> because I remember looking it up. What I can't remember is what it means. <laughs> <laughs> It means like when you trick someone. So if you were going out on a date with someone, yeah. I might put a picture up that's not of me or is me with like a set of abs, which, spoiler, I don't have. Oh, right. So um, on a dating app, if, if you put up a... a exactly. A misrepresentative yes, a photograph. a misrepresentation of yourself. Um, and... Uh, I'm I'm, I, you see, I'm now trying to... I'm <laughs> been told, why is that called catfishing? I'm not sure. I think is it started it, with a show that, in America. The idea there's, that cat, you're... there's catfish in the US, which is a show, I think. So maybe it's come oh, from that. Oh, it's right, I see. So it's nothing to do with either a cat or a fish. No, I don't think catfish. so. Unless right. someone's mistaken a cat for But if fish. you are catfishing, are you fishing for cats? <laughs> in which case, if you... Or are you fishing for catfish? I'm not sure. Yeah, the catfish is... Just a fish, really. It's not a, it's not a cat at all. <laughs> well, if I mean, anyone biologically knows, tweet us. Speaking. Let us know. Tweet us. So yes, the the dating misrepresentation episode. Yes, there is one. And <laughs> if only this wasn't live on the internet, it wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't be so embarrassing. Give me another clue. <sighs> It's got a very sort of 16th century twist. That's to not it. narrowing it down. <laughs> <laughs> the whole, not, the whole I'm not series sure what has I'm a 16th to spoil, century so twist. So I'm not, allowed, I'm yeah, not sure yeah, what I'm um, allowed to say. Yeah, no, what you've, you've made a very elegant, clever, contemporary <laughs> reference to something that I can't remember. <laughs> so, but it'd be a wonderful surprise. When I'm watching it, as well, they go, yeah, I'll go, exactly. oh, that's what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> this is the catfishing bit. <laughs> Well, let's go but to a social question. <laughs> Hopefully you'll be able to answer that one. Yeah. Uh, this is... one is from Super Caroline. Uh, she asked, what was your favourite scene to film for the series? And is there any more chance of any more soapbox videos? Um, oh, uh, the favourite scene to film. Well, I think there was, there's a scene I was great fun to film in the first episode, which is when... Um, because you know, in, in the storyline has uh, similarities with the storyline of um, *Midsummer Night's Dream*. So there's an issue with whether or not it is it is possible for someone to become uh, enchanted in such a way that they fall in love with the next person they lay eyes upon. Because um, scientific opinion is uh, divided to this day <laughs> on that issue. Uh, and there's a point at which what's, certainly what seems to be happening is that uh, the character played by Nigel Planer falls in love with uh, Rob Rouse's character Bottom while he's got a uh, donkey head on, <laughs> which is, again, an Adjective. echo of Shakespeare. And, uh, and that the filming the scene where Nigel Planer chased Rob Rouse round and round the table <laughs> trying to mount him. 
was um, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> it is brilliant. It is really, really funny. Um, Nigel's obviously one of the guest stars for this series, and we've also we've had some huge names that have been and some huge names coming up in this series. What I want to know is if you could cast anyone in the show in a guest role, who would it be and who would they play? Oh, no, that's that's tricky. I, I mean, there are loads of people. I, you know, I, I would love to work with. I'd love, you know, but I think a huge hero of mine has always been Michael Palin. Oh, and yeah. uh, I don't know, what, uh, you know, what maybe Michael Palin could play if, you know, if we kept making it until uh, James the First on the throne, <laughs> uh, which is uh, that's not a euphemism. <laughs> um, uh, but that he, you know, he he was for most for half of Shakespeare's working life, it was James the First on the throne, and I think that would be a great role for Michael Palin. To make series four, music. if anyone's out there listening, yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah, they, I will mention it to Ben. <laughs> and, yeah, you mentioned Ben there. This this has kind of been hailed as, as some of his best work since since Blackadder, uh, which was obviously behind. What do you think it is that makes this show so sort of compelling and so loved? Why do you think it's caught on so well? Um, well, I I, I, th I think it is the the script. I, th I think um, Ben is. Uh, a, an absolutely amazingly creative person comically. Mm. He comes, jokes just ooze out of his every pore. <laughs> and in this, he's found a subject he really knows about and he really cares about, and a way of making reference to the modern world. And that, that that's, you know, those are the bits I think a lot of the audience find most yeah. satisfying, where he's having a pop at something, you know, for example, you teed me up to say all, all the brilliant stuff he was saying about catfishing. <laughs> I failed that test. <laughs> but broadly, that is exactly what Ben does. He sees the modern world and he makes parallels to it yeah. in the 16th century. And that's a, it's a great way of taking the piss out of now, yeah. um, as well as taking the piss out of then. And <laughs> so I think that's his kind of comic brain particularly suits something where, you know, something from another age or another world yeah. where he can... Um, yeah, there's a lot of social commentary in episode one as well, isn't yeah. there? Kind of around, like, women and kind of their role in society and the role that they played back then to how they're seen yeah. now well, as well, isn't Well, there? it's obviously, you know, the, the, there's a lot of um, contemporary discussion about all of those issues. Mm. It's a, a hot topic now. And obviously through the prism of uh, the 16th century, <laughs> it's sort of, there's a huge possibility for quite dark jokes because <laughs> that what you know whatever uh, unfairness women suffer today was was magnified yeah. by uh, a thousand in the 16th century where you know as as I've said in the bit Ben wrote about a level results you know people people asking the question uh, is Shakespeare's writing sexist <laughs> and uh, Ben wrote for Will to reply I I lived in an age where women were quite literally male property and that's absolutely true. That was the law then. And you had this paradox, a fascinating paradox, that women were, didn't have any legal rights compared to men at all, apart from one woman, the queen, who was in charge of everyone. So it was sort of essentially one woman had more rights than any other human being, followed by all the men, followed by all the women. It's an original way of structuring a society. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about... It's basically, um, Elizabethans and bees are the only ones that go with that. <laughs> I want to talk about education, actually, because I read somewhere uh, yesterday, actually, that schools have actually been using this in classes to teach kids about Shakespeare. Is that amazing to you that it's actually turned out to be quite educational at the same time? Yeah, well, I'm, I, I, I'm delighted because <laughs> that's um, um, make, it's making a, a young... Well, I, I think I'm delighted. It's I'm, I'm hoping it's making a younger generation aware, aware of my work. <laughs> but then, in another way, it's making a younger generation equate the programmes I make with school. <laughs> so it's sort of... It's win-lose, isn't it? What, I hope, what I hope the teachers aren't doing is claiming that Upstart Crow is actually... Shakespearean writing, because <laughs> that wouldn't be quite fair. Ben Elton and Shakespeare, they are almost... Well, I think, you know, level, I think Ben right? is a great man, but I don't think he would lay claim to being quite Shakespeare. <laughs> but I will say one thing that Upstart Crow has over any of Shakespeare's works, and that's that it's shorter. <laughs> true, very true. How, how were you with Shakespeare at school? Um, I think I was... I, first Shakespeare production I ever saw, I was 12... And it was Midsummer Night's Dream, and I it was brilliant. I laughed like a drain. It was a really genuinely I had fun. 
The second production I saw was, I think, Henry the Fourth Part One was stultifying. Yeah. Really boring, drab. It was supposed to be about kings, but they had sort of set it in an office in the 1950s. For <laughs> so it was just all briefcases and people looking tired. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and that was not a positive experience. I think the thing is, Shakespeare's definitely a, a genius, and I think the greatest writer, the greatest artist there's ever been of any sort. But his work has dated it's in archaic language and mm. you need a lot of skill to bring out the genius and get through the bits that don't work so well to a modern yeah. audience and so i think it's perfectly possible to say a lot of shakespearean productions are boring without <laughs> slagging off the man himself exactly and I've... obviously and then there are brilliant shakespeare productions that aren't boring but it's an achievement to stop him being boring. It doesn't jump off the page anymore. Yeah, it does. I, f I suddenly feel very triggered thinking back to my A-levels right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thinking about Henry VIII. Uh, we've had a social question in. This one is from Rihanna on Instagram. I don't think it's the Rihanna, but if it is, hello, Rihanna. Uh, she asks, what is your favorite Shakespeare play? Oh, I think it would probably be a Midsummer Night's Dream. That or Richard III. I saw a, a terrific production of Richard III. That's the, the, my two least boring experiences of Shakespeare in the theatre, which were extremely unboring, <laughs> were that original production of Midsummer Night's Dream I saw when I was 12, and then a production of Richard III, which starred um, Ian McKellen. It was a National Theatre production, went on tour, and that it was just incredibly dramatic and frightening and cool. It's one of my favourites. Julius Caesar as well, I think, is up there for me. We've got an episode about Julius oh, Caesar there we in, are. This, yeah, <laughs> in this series. Uh, we've had another social question, and this one is from Mike Catola. Uh, she asks, do you and the rest of the cast get the giggles while filming, and what is most likely to set you all off? Um, well, I, I, as I say, I think the sight of uh, Nigel Planer trying to mount a man with a donkey's head, <laughs> that set me off. Uh, I think there was a... There was a thing where I had to do a lot of sneezing in the in series two. It was the uh, episode basically about Othello, and I, I had to fake a lot of sneezing. I've, I found that, I find that <laughs> process very amusing. Um, but the thing about having doing it in front of a studio audience is you, you're much less likely to, to get the giggles yourself because you're so focused on trying to make mm. them laugh. Um, in a way, when you're filming something in a, you know, a closed, environment where it's only the people you're working with there then it's much easier to slightly forget you know to to be naughtier yeah you, ne you never l totally lose focus when there's an audience there yeah that is true uh, much like this yeah, lot here <laughs> now I, I have to ask you you're here and i know that a lot of people in the room will want to ask and i'm sure it's the question you get asked everywhere you go and you're probably sick of answering it peep show any chance of any more um I don't think so. No, um, what we said when we f uh, made the last series is that we would consider doing another show about those characters in sort of 20 years' time, when they're in a completely different period in their lives. And that idea we, we all have in, you know, me and... 17 years to go! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe in that form, but I think in our heads it would be a different programme rather than more of the same programme. And back series two, is there any news? Or yeah, we'll be shooting that in uh, January, February next year. So um, that's been delayed because, uh, because Simon Blackwell, who writes it, has been working on the new... Uh, David Copperfield film ah. that Armando Iannucci is directing. So. Well, so we've had to wait. We've had so to we've wait had for to, that. Yeah, to get apparently, in order to apparently, David Copperfield wasn't sufficiently well written by Charles Dickens, <laughs> <laughs> and so Simon Blackwell has been finishing that off. Well, if he could hurry up and, yeah. and, and speed it along, then we can get <laughs> another series of back. Uh, before we go, we've got one more social question uh, for you. Uh, Nicole on Instagram asks, will we ever see you and Victoria together on QI? I don't know. I, I think, I don't think we, we've done like radio, the old radio recording together, and which we've, you know, we've enjoyed. And, but I, th I think we slightly feel like we shouldn't pop up as a couple too much <laughs> in case people find that. Uh, uh, you know, unbearable. <laughs> so, um, so we, we, we're we're reticent, reticent about that. Going to limit yourself. Yeah. Uh, finally, before we go, uh, what's what's next? What have you got coming up for the rest of the year? Because I know you're pretty busy, aren't you? We're doing a, another series of back beginning of next year. We've sh uh, shot another series of Would I Lie to You? That oh, I think yes. will be out. Love that show. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That'll be out, I think, in the autumn, and then we're doing another series of that next year as well. 
Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Oh, well, lots of stuff to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, most of all, Upstart Crow, which yeah. starts next Wednesday, 8.30 uh, p.m. on BBC Two, so make sure you tune into that. Uh, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, make sure you join us again in 30 minutes' time, when Mr. Easy will be here live on that very sofa. Uh, in the meantime, everyone, though, please give it up one last time for David Mitchell. Thanks very much. And I will catch you guys very soon. Thanks very much for watching.